Thank you, and I want to thank the organizers uh, of this uh, meeting for inviting me. Um, let's see, I'm going to try to cover a lot of territory, so I'll, uh, you're going to forgive me, I hope, uh, if I move uh, quickly here. I'm going to be talking about the uh, addictive properties of uh, caffeine. There will be some redundancy between what I say and Chuck O'Brien says uh, afterwards. So uh, what I want to do is talk very briefly about caffeine subjective effects, reinforcing effects, tolerance, physical dependence, and addiction. Caffeine subjective effects refer to drug-induced changes in an individual's experience or feelings. Numerous studies have been done um, which show that the, their, the qualitative subjective effects of caffeine are dose-dependent. So there are dozens of studies, but these studies show that lower doses, say 20 to 200 milligrams, generally produce predominantly positive uh, subjective effects, well-being, energy, alertness. Uh, and as you increase the dose, you can run into uh, dysphoric effects of, uh, of caffeine. The reinforcing effects refers to the self-administration of caffeine. And this has been demonstrated very clearly in both laboratory animals and uh, in humans. Uh, this shows some work in baboons self-administering caffeine in either an erratic or inconsistent pattern, but nonetheless it functions as a reinforcer. That's been showed uh, in a variety of different species. Uh, and uh, there are a whole number of studies in humans that have also been done that have demonstrated caffeine reinforcement effects. Before I uh, even uh, 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 summarize those, I just want to make the obvious point that the circumstantial evidence that caffeine maintains self-administration is absolutely overwhelming. That regular daily consumption uh, in pharmacologically active do doses widespread. This is the most widely used mood-altering drug in the world. Historically, caffeine consumption has been long-term, stable, resistant to suppression. Consumption occurs in widely different vehicles and in widely varying uh, cultural and uh, social circumstances. These are just um, uh, bullet points from uh, perhaps 15 to 20 papers that have been published in humans on the reinforcing effects of caffeine. So it's really well documented. Caffeine can function as a reinforcer when administered in capsules, coffee, soft drinks, range of conditions under which caffeine functions as a reinforcer is not as broad as classic psychomotor stimulants like amphetamine or cocaine. That's not surprising. The, the uh, caffeine reinforcement is an inverted U-shaped function of dose. Normal subjects, there are wide individual differences in susceptibility to caffeine reinforcement. Some people find it reinforcing other, other people's not so much. And avoidance of abstinence associated with withdrawal symptoms plays a central role in the reinforcement uh, in regular consumers. However, such a history is not necessary for caffeine to function as a reinforcer. Turning on now uh, to uh, the phenomena of tolerance. So tolerance refers to reduced responsiveness uh, due to drug exposure. Tolerance has been clearly demonstrated again both in laboratory animals and in humans. This just shows some work with rats showing that caffeine produces insurmountable uh, tolerance. So uh, chronically uh, treated group of rats shows no response to caffeine. Uh, the group that's not treated with caffeine uh, shows an inverted U-shaped function. There's no cross tolerance to amphetamine. And that insurmountable tolerance when you get up to high doses also occurs in humans. So this is uh, one of our studies showing the effects of a 300 milligram uh, challenge uh, to uh, a group of individuals who have been maintained just on placebo. They're caffeine free and, you're, and here you're seeing increases in tension, anxiety, and jitteriness. And a group that's receiving chronic caffeine 900 milligrams per day, a large dose, total absence of effects. So this is, as with the animals, it's complete insurmountable uh, tolerance. 
Moving on to physical dependence, this is uh, withdrawal. This refers to time-limited disruption of mood or behavior after cessation of chronic dosing. Again, very well demonstrated both in animals and humans. Uh, some older work by Holtzman in rats uh, showing uh, that uh, this is a control group, this is, uh, this is just activity uh, count, and here's a group of rats that are withdrawn from caffeine at this point, switch to water, and their activity decreases and then recovers over the course of five days. And that doesn't look so different than what happens with uh, humans. This was one of our studies, uh, double-blind, switching people between uh, caffeine, uh, placebo, and caffeine, uh, elevations in headache, lethargy, uh, decreases in ability to concentrate, resolving over the course of several days uh, to a week. Uh, this is showing some data from a study we published uh, in New England Journal um, some, some years ago when we abruptly switched people uh, to placebo under conditions actually in which they were uh, blind to the manipulation. They knew they were just participating in a, in a food dietary study. And uh, in this case, you get about 50 percent of people uh, reporting a moderate or severe headache uh, uh, and about 11 or 12 percent uh, reporting uh, substantial increases in uh, depression. Uh, decreases in vigor, increases in fatigue, uh, decreased psychomotor tapping uh, performance, and in this case, about 13 percent used uh, med medications in an unauthorized fashion. This was to treat a headache. In experimental studies, there have been a lot of them, probably 75 studies, uh, and analysis of the ones that permit this kind of data analysis shows that um, about 50 percent of individuals in the experimental studies report headache, although headaches common as a withdrawal symptom, uh, withdrawal can also occur without headache. These are the symptom clusters of caffeine withdrawal. These are also the ones that are now recognized by DSM-5, uh, so they include uh, headache, fatigue. Uh, dysphoric mood, uh, difficulty concentrating, flu-like symptoms. The incidence of clinically significant or functional impairment, that is when people can't do what they would normally do, is 13 percent in prospective experimental studies, 9 percent in retrospective uh, survey studies. many industries all around the world. And this just they gives an example the CEO from of fake brew. Uh, and the co founder one of One study that uh, did a as double well as blind Ellen um, Baker and uh, award winning uh, placebo cartoonist challenge. And these Tom are the Holt. kinds of functional Thanks impairments that people Someone are reporting. Right so, in this case, this individual missed work, they vomited, this one uh, couldn't perform work responsibilities, needed a spouse to care for children, went to bed early. To Buffalo, Multiple where they costly mistakes at work, left work early, went to bed early. The University this person of Buffalo is the leader in global education and research. party calls and spouse research. home early. UB has more than 75 exchange programs with universities around the kids. world. <laughs> the University of Buffalo is a global leader among 21st century <laughs> research about that. institutions. Um, Our work is saving uh, the lives of There have been a, a variety of parametric studies. Um, so this is a robust uh, parametric phenomena, chronic Thanks maintenance dose, increases the probability and severity of withdrawal, duration of maintenance, increases as a function of days, you need at least three days of chronic exposure to get any withdrawal signal. Uh, once a day dosing is sufficient uh, to produce um, uh, withdrawal syndrome. Thanks for holding. Go Your call will be answered momentarily. Of days. Did and re-administration of caffeine Buffalo reverses abstinence in a, in a Our very faculty uh, clear study dose all kinds of natural and man-made disasters. It's important to recognize that um, to more avoidance of abstinence associated with withdrawal symptoms UV, plays a central role in habitual others. consumption of caffeine. Thanks for calling many, the University of many Buffalo. Studies now de Someone have will be on the line that. in a moment to assist you. And While studies waiting, show that withdrawal know, potentiates the reinforcing of effects of caffeine. Studies also show that withdrawal plays an important role in development of preferences for Today, flavors UB paired with caffeine. 
campus at uh, Dr. Temple just of New York presented some of that with more data than was actually a good literature degrees showing and uh, conditions, uh, and professional programs. flavor preferences, the University of Buffalo and, is and a public those interact university with, dedicated to uh, academic excellence. with withdrawal as well. Like the city we call home, UB Moving finally into this area of, of uh, addiction or so-called DSM dependence pragmatic uh, syndrome, that enables us to reach others uh, every day. Eight the University of Buffalo so is, is a proud small of its literature relative to the Association of American literature. Universities. Eight studies it's an organization show that some of the leading public and private fulfill, uh, DSM criteria and UB shares for this distinction with schools such as Michigan, uh, Cornell, DSM and Ohio State. Four or DSM Thanks. five criteria for diagnosis of a substance dependence uh, disorder applied to caffeine. And these are the studies. I'm just going to um, show you some of the results from a study uh, reported by uh, Giuliano last year. Uh, this was a, a study uh, to seek out individuals who were sufficiently distressed by their caffeine use to seek out outpatient treatment. And we wanted to describe them demographically, psychiatrically, characterize their problematic use. Uh, they were recruited from the community using advertisements, invited to participate in a current program for caffeine dependence. Uh, people with current drug dependence other than nicotine were excluded. We wanted to be very conservative and, and look for uh, hard cases of pure caffeine dependence. Clinical psychologists did the uh, evaluation. This was a high-functioning group of adults. 40, 40, there are 90, 94 of them in total, 41 years on average, about half female, most college-educated. Uh, heavy caffeine use. These are people who are seeking treatment, and they're uh, about 550 milligrams per day. So that's up over that 90th percentile we were talking about. But these are the main criteria. I'm just going to show you three of the criteria that we think are most definitional of what we call addiction. And these are the same three criteria that uh, DSM-5 is requiring uh, in order to um, qualify for a research diagnosis of caffeine dependence. DSM-5 did not officially recognize the diagnosis. They said it was. Um, there were too few studies uh, completed at this point. Uh, but what they uh, did do is propose research criteria, and these are the three criteria that they use. So persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control use, that was endorsed by 89 percent. Uh, characteristic withdrawal symptoms uh, or use to uh, relieve or avoid withdrawal, 96 percent, and, and 43 percent reported functional impairment, that is, uh, severity sufficient to produce impairment of normal activities such as unable to go to work or going to sleep at work. Um, and uh, third criteria, continued use despite persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problems. And this is just instructive. So 83 percent reported physical problems. Examples included stomach problems, cardiovascular problems, pregnancy, sleep, urinary problems. 67 percent reported psychological problems, including anxiety, irritability, anger. 43 percent have been told by a physician or another medical professional to modify their caffeine use because of various medical conditions, such as pregnancy or, uh, or headache. So uh, I, I want to draw a couple of uh, conclusions about caffeine withdrawal and addiction. Uh, with respect to withdrawal, numerous studies, uh, I'm guessing now about 75, indicate that cessation of caffeine consumption after a period of daily intake can result in distressing withdrawal syndrome, resulting in functional impairment. This conclusion is consistent with the DSM-5 committee recognition of caffeine withdrawal as a diagnosis. It's also consistent with a recent survey study that was done, it's in press, of 500 addiction professionals, the majority of whom endorse that caffeine withdrawal can be of clinical importance. With respect to uh, caffeine addiction, there are eight studies <laughs> suggest that some people become clinically dependent on caffeine, that is, unable to quit, continue to use despite medical problems, and uh, are sufficiently distressed to seek treatment. This is well, less well established, uh, again, consistent with the DSM-5 committee recommendation 
that this be uh, re uh, recommended as a diagnosis for further study. But uh, the uh, survey study of 500 addiction professionals uh, showed that the majority endorsed that caffeine use disorder, in fact, does occur and some people could benefit from professional help in quitting. Just a couple of implications of these findings for uh, this uh, vulnerable population of, uh, of youth. Uh, first one, tolerance. So individuals who don't use caffeine regularly are going to be substantially more sensitive to caffeine. We saw that caffeine can produce complete and insurmountable tolerance. At lower doses, it produces partial tolerance. Most studies characterizing the effects of uh, caffeine on uh, adverse events are looking at chronic users. And this is not going to be of help to uh, estimating what the risk is to a population of non-users. An another implication for youth, the, do the dose dependence. Individuals who weigh less, this is obvious, uh, uh, all, all these effects are dose dependent, right? And individuals who weigh less are going to receive proportionally greater dose of caffeine. 13 year old boy weighs 55 percent as much as a 50 year old man. Condition, uh, implications of condition, taste, preference, and addiction. So it's well known that, that uh, individuals report strong flavor preferences for brands. This is the Coke versus Pepsi challenge. The likely mechanism under this is what, we, what I mentioned earlier about these conditioned flavor preferences. Initial flavor preferences are likely to evolve into habitual brand preferences, perhaps lasting a lifetime. Uh, these facts are not going to be lost on those marketing and energy drinks, and they may incentivize promotion of products to younger and younger populations. So much as the tobacco companies were accused of doing and marketing tobacco products uh, until they were more tightly regulated. Final uh, implication for this uh, youth population, withdrawal and addiction. If physical dependence develops, youth are less likely than adults to have the financial or transportation or other resources to assure an uninterrupted supply of caffeine. If they are withdrawal sensitive, and there's only going to be a portion that are, their habitual uh, pattern of intake is, to, is going to be delayed or disrupted. They will experience adverse emotional, cognitive, behavioral consequences. Uh, that's a concern. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Griffiths. We now pass on to um, Dr. Charles O'Brien, who's professor of uh, psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania, and he also directs a clinical research program that has a major impact on the treatment of addictive disorders. Dr. 